share my screen. That's not it. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very, yep. very good. All right. I'm just going to go to the module section. Uh-oh, if my internet's working. Here it goes. And so <clears throat> for the next practical, you're covering just some definitions and homework information out of this module. In your Engage Lab Manual, it's just called, that chapter is called Homework 1, Introduction to the Integumentary and Skeletal System. Basically, it's just, hey, here's an introduction into some terms for the integumentary system. Here's an introduction into some terms for the skeletal system. So you need to make sure, if you haven't started yet, go through this chapter in your Engage Manual. Do the practice work, all right? So this is sort of a homework session of terminology. The two main modules that with content that's gonna be on your practicals, your second practical is gonna be the integumentary system, which is exercise four, and then the appendicular skeleton. So, and just to let you know, our next practical is like in two weeks already. So you need to, if you have not started yet, you need to start today, all right? You need to get through this stuff Start doing all your pre and post lab assignments and get them completed. All right, so just to let you know, I added this PowerPoint. It's a fairly generic PowerPoint. I'm gonna show you uh, some various slides in it after I go through my book chapter, but I added this PowerPoint. I'm gonna uh, pull that up uh, as we go through. Um, within the models book, which is the, the lab manual that I had written. Um, Dr. Blaylock took all of the AMP1 pictures and made Quizlets. I did all the AMP2s. Dr. Blaylock did all the AMP1 pictures out of my book. And so I went and got the link to Dr. Blaylock's Quizlet page. Now, on this page, you'll see models of the muscles, the bones, the skin, all the nervous system. All the pictures <clears throat> for models, most of them, that we're gonna be covering for the rest of the semester are is in this Quizlet page, all right? <clears throat> and on the Quizlet page, you're gonna see pictures of a whole bunch of models in different sections. You'll have to scroll and find the one that you need because the way he has it organized is they're just pretty much all on one big page. Uh, when you get the AMP2, I, I separated mine out into folders, um, but, it's still all the same. It's all in that, in that Quizlet, all right? So in that Quizlet, you're gonna find pictures of models that have um, pointers on it. And if you hover over the little circle, it tells you what the structure is, all right? When you're learning how to identify structures on models. So that's what the Quizlets are gonna be used for. To help you quiz yourself, you're gonna look at the picture, oh, what is that? And if you don't know what it is, then you hover over the little pointer and it'll tell you what the answer is, all right? <clears throat> now also, I'm uh, starting to add the chapters of the book I, I, we used to use, which we don't use anymore. It's sort of a workbook that I put together a long time ago. <clears throat> and so don't worry about the chapter number. The chapter number doesn't mean anything it's the number of the chapter and the order in which I made the book a long time ago. But since we don't use it anymore, what I, what I do now and uh, a couple other instructors, I sent them the PDF file. So I'm going to pull this up in a minute and I'm going to, I'm going to go through the inf information in here before we do the PowerPoint. But it, it, you, if you look at the link, that's right at the top, it says answers to figure exercises in the models book. Well, within the chapter that I post, which I'm gonna be posting throughout the rest of the semester, when there's models in here, you have to look at the figure number in the chapter, then you go find the figure number in the appendix right here. And it'll have the answers to all of the questions, all right? 
I mean, all of the, the pictures that are in the model's book. So those are, these are the four links that I just added this morning to the course. Okay. So it's going to be some fairly helpful learning resource links um, along with the ones that everybody else is using down the learning resources in the lab exercise material. All right. So let me pull this up. This is the mo this is what I call the models book. And you'll see at the end of, of the link, I'm going to leave it to where you can see PDF. You'll probably always see like chapter or something, but I'm going to try and put them always at the top of the page. All right. So I'm going to open this up. See if it pulls it up. All right, can everybody see the page? All right, very good. Yep. Okay, so um, this is like just a little chapter I put together. It has some text information in it concerning, uh, you know, the functions of the skin, what cells are there, what types of glands are there, and the like. Right, along with a couple of pictures of the, of models. I don't have that older skin model in here. That's why you got to look uh, in in the Quizlet. And through the pre and post lab assignments, there is an older model of the skin that you're going to be identifying structures on. I also put, you know, some slides I used to use in lab. I took pictures of them, but I'm going to show you several different slides and tell you what they are so that uh, you'll be able to recognize and identify it no matter what coloration stain is being used. I'm going to tell you how you can identify what you're supposed to be identifying. All right. Now, at least in this chapter, it won't be that way with all of the model book chapters, but at least in this chapter, I did write out some text information I want you guys to learn. Um, most of this text information will be kind of stuff that's going to be on the physiology test, but there are a couple of questions, standalone questions on the practical that, can, that, that deal with some of the text information, but most of it is identification. All right. So what I want to do now is just go through the introduction of the skin go through, you know, the functions and before we start getting into all the pictures and everything, uh, it shouldn't take too long, but you need to know the main functions of the skin. So what is the skin, first of all? Um, because on the practical, people were writing skin and technically the tissue is in the epidermis of the skin. So when we say skin, it implies an organ. The skin, by the way, is the largest organ in our body. It covers our whole body by volume, the largest. And the skin itself is part of what we call the integumentary system. So you see the system, integumentary system. It not only includes the skin, which has several parts to it, but it also includes accessory structures and various glands like hair, nails, and glands all in uh, and uh, distributed through the skin. The skin itself is separated into two major layers, and we're gonna go through the layers, separated into what's called the epidermis, and then the dermis, right? And then below the skin is what we call the hypodermis. Hypodermis means below dermis, right? Or we also call that the subcutaneous layer or sub-Q layer. So, we're going to cover these various layers. We're going to see what's in it and where the structures are located. So what are the functions? Well, our skin, one of the primary functions is protection. All right. Um, also, while we're in here, can you guys mute unless you have to ask me a question? All right. Thank you. All right. So as far as the skin is concerned, your skin is our first line of defense against everything. It basically separates the outside world, the external environment, from the internal environment. And it does a pretty good job of that. It's called the cutaneous membrane. And it's a physical barrier that prevents the entry of pathogens, microbes, you know, bacteria, stuff like that. And it also is uh, very good at protecting us against chemicals. Maybe a chemical got on your skin. 
Um, you might have a, a, an abrasion or a cut, you know, something like that. Our skin heals very well. And if it's not, if the injury is not too bad, the skin does a pretty good job of preventing uh, bacteria and everything else from entering the body. However, if you do have a cut that goes through the superficial layers of the skin, like the epidermis, down into the dermis, then you create what's called a portal of entry. And you'll learn some of this in micro, where bacteria and other pathogens can get into the hole that you created. You, you had a burn, an abrasion, a cut. And in which case, your physical barrier was compromised. So what do you have to do? Well, you got to go clean it up. You got to put antibiotic ointment on it, stuff like that at the, the least case scenario. The worst case scenario, you have to go to the doctor and get stitches because it's a deep cut, something like that, right? But it still has to be treated. So our skin protects us, protects us from everything that's on the outside world, right? Your skin is also a sensory organ. We have special types of receptors that allow us to feel differences in temperature. Is it cold? Is it hot? We have receptors that allow us to feel pressure. Touch receptors. Touch receptors are called tactile receptors. So we can feel pressure, vibration, things like that. We also can feel pain. We have pain receptors. They're called nociceptors. So we have these various types of receptors associated with our, with our skin and our epidermis, and it allows us to sense the outside world. So our skin is a very good sensory organ to allow us to react to changes in our environment. I mean, let's face it, if it's freezing cold outside, you're not gonna go outside in your swim trunks, right? So, and that's just a, you know, a very simple example. But we recognize when there's changes in the environment because of sensory input to our nervous system, which we're gonna learn in a couple of weeks. Our skin also is involved in thermal regulation. Thermal regulation is the regulation of body temperature. And this one's pretty easy. You guys know what happens, at least partly, probably. If you get cold, you shiver. I mean, why do we shiver? Well, we have receptors that detect when it's cold, and we have an erratic response from the nervous system to our skeletal muscles that cause the muscle, skeletal muscle to contract and relax in a vigorous manner. And the contraction of that skeletal muscle produces heat. And that heat is then delivered to the blood and it warms us up. The other thing that happens when you're cold is the blood vessels that run in the dermis of the skin start to decrease the di their diameter. That's called vasoconstriction. So when a blood vessel decreases its diameter, it's called vasoconstriction. And when we're cold, the blood vessels in the, in the dermis of the skin, because there's none in the epidermis, the blood vessels in the dermis of the skin vasoconstrict and it prevents blood from getting to the surface of our body. That way we have less blood reaching our skin so that blood is stays in the core of our body and it doesn't pick up the, it doesn't release heat in which case we stay warm. So when we're cold, we get vasoconstriction. That's why your fingers, fingers kind of turn purple when you're cold because blood is being rerouted away from the surface of your skin to the core of your body via vasoconstriction. Now, everybody knows what happens when you get hot. You sweat, right? You produce perspiration. So we have sweat glands called sudoriferous glands in our skin that produce perspiration or sweat. And as that sweat goes to the surface of our body, the water evaporates from the surface of our skin. It pulls heat away from our skin, in which case it cools the blood off. So that cooler blood then leaves the skin and goes to the core of your body and it starts to cool down your body temperature. The other thing that happens when you're hot is the vessels in the skin vasodilate. They get bigger in diameter. I mean, let's face it. If your body temperature is hot, you want that hot blood to get to the surface of the body so that heat can be dissipated from the blood off the surface of our body. And so the blood can be cooled down. 
So we actually are changing the temperature of the blood in the body by vasoconstricting and vasodilating. So the skin is, a, is, a major, uh, is majorly involved in thermal regulation. Our skin also is involved in the production of vitamin D. Some of y'all probably know that already. When you go out in sunlight, UV light hits our skin and we begin a chemical reaction that produces a steroid. Vitamin D is a steroid. It's produced from cholesterol. And so uh, an immature form of vitamin D starts to be produced when we introduce our skin to UV radiation. However, you don't want to just go out into the sun and stay out there for a long period of time because the cost benefit of making vitamin D relative to you getting a sunburn and possibly developing skin cancer later, you know, that's not good. So, but when you just have your regular skin exposed, I'm not talking about laying out at a beach or whatnot, but when you just have your regular skin, your hands, your arms, and your face, like in the summer, exposed, you, you expose your skin to enough UV radiation to produce enough vitamin D to keep you healthy. But it doesn't hurt to always go do vitamin D supplementation either for that, for that matter. So our skin produces vitamin D for us, which is good for your bones, as you know, and we're going to get into uh, some of what happens with vitamin D next week. Our skin also is involved in absorption and secretion. Now, you know probably that it secretes stuff already because, let's face it, you sweat. The sudoriferous glands or sweat glands produce perspiration, goes to the surface of the body, and obviously your skin is secreting something. But we have other glands that secrete uh, uh, substances as well that we're going to get to in a minute. But our skin also is involved in absorbing certain things. And for that reason, that's exactly why you can go get a patch. Like uh, people that try to stop smoking, they get the nicotine patch. Um, they used to have like the pain patches. Uh, you know, females could get the, the patch uh, for birth control if they even still use those, I don't know. But nonetheless, why would we be able to put a patch on our skin if the chemicals, the drugs, and the medication can't get through our skin? Of course they can. Lipid-soluble substances can get through our, our skin quite easily, right? Uh, and we'll talk more about that as well. The other thing our skin is involved with is alerting our immune system to help fight off infectious agents, pathogens. Now your skin is not directly part of the, what we call the lymphatic system or the uh, involved in immunity directly, but there are certain cells that we're about to cover that are involved in helping activate or telling your immune system cells, like helper T cells, to trigger immune responses when microorganisms are trying to infect our skin and get into our body. All right, so it's involved in that, all right? All right, now, um, I'm gonna run through this text information with you and then we'll look at some pictures uh, in a minute, but we're gonna cover the epidermis. Uh, the epidermis contains five basic layers. Now, those five basic layers are called stratum something. And the five basic layers that there are, are found on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet and what we call thick skin. So on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, we have five layers that make up the epidermis. And the epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin. The epidermis, is basically made up of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that you learned on our first practical. That's the epithelium that makes up the epidermis. Now, on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, you have five layers, but on what we call thick skin, but everywhere else on your body, your arms, your legs, your you know, abdomen, your face, you only have four layers. So one of the five layers is missing in thin skin. And we're gonna look at that. So here are the layers. Here's the five basic layers. Um, I'm gonna start down here at number five. I should have wrote it the other way. So, and the reason why I say that is this. 
this is the deepest of the five layers. So this one is the deepest in the epidermis. This is the most superficial up here. So we're gonna to have to learn the order in which these layers occur in as well. So the stratum basally is the layer that is the deepest of the epidermis and is composed of one layer, only one cell layer of cuboidal to small columnar shaped looking cells. Now what's interesting about this layer, which is made up of those cuboidal type cells down there, that one, that one cell layer, that one cell layer called the basally layer is the layer where the cells divide via mitosis throughout your entire life. The cells in the stratum basally divide via mitosis, which is a cloning event, and through our entire life, so all of the cells that form in the epidermis come from our stratum basally. So they divide over and over and over and over again through your entire life. Now, as they divide at the bottom, they always push the cells that were above them upward. So as new cells are dividing in the stratum basally, the older cells that were already made that were above that cell layer get pushed upward into the next layer. So the next layer going superficially is called the stratum spinosum. The stratum spinosum is made up of about eight to 10 rows of cells. And they kind of take on this spiny looking appearance. That's why it's called spinosum uh, because of desmosomes. Desmosomes are cellular junctions and uh, when we fix the tissue so we can see it on a slide, the cells start to pull apart from each other and the membrane gets stretched out into these little spiny looking projections. So it's technically called the sp uh, spinosum because of the little spines that appear when we fix the tissue. So in the stratum spinosum, those cells just came from the stratum basally. The cells in the stratum spinosum will continually move upward as the ones in the stratum basally keep dividing. And they just divide, divide, divide. They get pushed upward, get pushed upward, and get pushed upward until they get into the next layer. The next layer of the epidermis is called the stratum granulosum. It's about three to five rows of cells, and they start to flatten out. Notice I said the cells in the stratum basally are kind of cuboidal. Some of them kind of look like a small columnar cell. But the tissue that makes up the epidermis is called a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So this tissue is actually named for the shapes of the cells that occur in the superficial layers, not the bottom layers. So as they start to go into what's called the stratum granulosum, this layer is called that because the cells start to accumulate dark staining granules with a precursor to a compound which is called keratohyalin, a precursor compound for the production of a tough protein called keratin. So this molecule starts to accumulate in these little granules in this layer. And when we stain the tissue, it stains kind of dark. So you can start to see all the little granules filled with the precursor to this protein, keratin. Now, Keratin starts to build up in the cells, and after the cells get pushed out of the stratum granulosum, they will either move into the stratum lucidum, if the skin is on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. This stratum lucidum layer is only found in thick skin, and thick skin is only found on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. The cells, when they leave the stratum granulosum, are all dead. The cells all die at the end of this layer. So when they get pushed upward, they're already dead. There's no more functional organelles in there. They basically are a bag of keratin. And that's why this tissue is called keratinized stratified squamous epithelium.
is what makes up the epidermis. It's because the superficial layers of the epidermis, the cells are all dead and they're filled with keratin. Keratin is the protein that protects us. It makes the surface layers of your epidermis kind of tough. I mean, let's face it, the, the skin does a pretty good job of protecting you. If, you. if you scrape it real quick, but it's not that bad, you don't really have an injury. Why is that? Because the cells are dead at the surface and they're filled with this hard protein. It's a hard water resistant protein. But also because there's many, 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 many layers of cells. So if you get a little scrape, you might, you're scraping some cells away, but you're not cutting way down into the deepest part of your skin. So if we're on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet, the cells would go from the granulosum layer up into the lucidum layer. However, if you're, if you're dealing with thin skin, which is on the rest of your body, everywhere else besides the palms and the soles of your feet, the cells would go from the granulosum layer directly into the corneal layer. This is the thickest of all of the layers the stratum corneum. The very surface layers of the stratum corneum are the layers of dead cells that you see on the outside of your body. Yep, every cell that you see on the outside of your body are dead epithelial cells. They're all dead. And they're part of the stratum corneum. Now the stratum corneum contains all these dead keratinocytes. And if you say on, the, on your hands, if, if a person that works outside a lot with their hands, they might have calluses. Everybody knows what a callus is probably. So where you have a lot of friction on your skin, like in the palms of your hands, maybe even on the bottom of your feet, you might get a hard patch of skin, that callus. You know what that is? It's a, it's a, little isolated area of the thickening of the stratum corneum in that region because you have been introducing friction to that part of your skin. And so if you're adding friction over time, over and over and over to the same place, we have a protection mechanism. Let's put some more dead cells in that one spot to help protect us from that friction. And that's what we call a callus. So that's part of the stratum corneum. All right, so those are the five cell layers. So on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, you have all five layers. All of the cells come from the bottom layer and they migrate upward from one layer to the next over time until they get to the very top of the epidermis, which is the stratum corneum. And when they get to the very most superficial layers of the stratum corneum on the very top of it, they then slough off the surface of your body. That's called exfoliation. I'm sure all of the females know what that is because they buy these special soaps, they exfoliate their face. Exfoliation is when you are basically rubbing off the superficial layers of dead cells from the stratum corneum. Now it does happen normally. About 80% of the dust in your house, by the way, are dead skin cells. Pretty nasty. I mean, if you think about it, when you walk through your house, you know, like on a Sunday morning, you see light coming in through the window and you kind of see dust and, you know, and you walk through it and you breathe it up. You just inhaled a whole bunch of dead skin cells. It's kind of nasty. I didn't want to be the only one that knows that, by the way. Okay, so all of those dead skin cells are sloughing off the surface of our body because we are constantly having new cells coming up from the bottom. So you know how long it takes to go from the bottom all the way to the top? On average, it takes about four weeks for the cells to move through all of those layers. So it's about a four week journey and it never stops. It goes on over and over and over through your whole life. Another thing that is amazing is if you cut your skin, let's say you cut down through your epidermis and you even cut down into the dermis. You cut, your, you cut yourself. Well, you don't have to wait four weeks for your cut to heal because there are special chemical signal molecules that are released that causes the cells in the stratum basally to increase the rate at which they divide via mitosis. So they 
they increase how fast they divide when there's an injury. So they can fill in the hole that you made when you cut down through all these layers. Pretty cool, huh? So after the injury is healed, they go back to their normal, slow, there's not really that slow, but their normal rate of mitosis. So when you cut yourself, they increase mitosis rate, mitotic rate, to fill in the gap that we cut down through this, these layers. And when it's all healed up, they go back to their normal rate. And they move from one layer to the next as they go until they get to the very top again. Dr. Russell. Go ahead. Um, so whenever somebody gets a cut and they get like stitches, does that help with like increasing the- Okay, the, the reason why we have to get stitches is ultimately um, just to allow the wound to heal better without becoming infected. Um, and it helps minimize scarring. So you need stitches when the cut goes into the deeper parts of your dermis. And even when you cut down to the bottom of your dermis, I'm going to show you that on a picture in a minute. Um, because when you start getting deeper and deeper in the dermis of the skin, and even in the hypodermis, if you cut all the way down through to, to the fat pad. Sometimes mm -hmm. people have a cut that's so deep, you can see the little fatty pad down there. Right. You need stitches because those blood vessels get bigger and bigger and bigger as the deeper we go into the body. They're really tiny if you have a superficial cut. So you could just handle that by putting pressure on it and putting a Band-Aid on it. But ultimately, we need stitches to help prevent, uh, after it's cleaned up, prevent further bacteria from getting in there and cause an infection and to allow it to heal quickly. Um, because, uh, well, we're not really going through wound healing right now, but um, ultimately that, that would be called what's uh, called deep wound healing. If you're interested in that, it's at the back of chapter five in your textbook. And I may mention some of that later on, but I'm not positive. But yeah, that's when you, that's when you need stitches. And also just to let you know, your epidermis does not scar. When someone scars, has a scar from a cut or stretch marks, which are called striae, like in pregnant females uh, or bodybuilders that, that gain muscle mass too quickly, those are splits in the collagen fibers in the dermis of the skin. So when you have a cut and you cut down through your epidermis and you cut down into the dermis, you're, in the dermis, you're splitting those collagen fibers apart. And ultimately, those collagen fibers have to be refilled in. They fibroblasts refill in the collagen fibers in that hole, and you can see it through the surface of the body. And that's what we call a scar. All right. So our epidermis does not scar because we constantly slough off all of those cells through our whole life and make new ones all the way from the bottom. Good question, by the way. Okay. I was just wondering, because I work in the ER, and a lot of people come in for cuts, and they're always like, like, wanting uh, like stitches to heal faster so it, it if depends on how deep it is to be perfectly honest with you you could stick a, a thing of duct tape around it mm -hmm. of course that's not too sterile <laughs> and so what stitches do when when you're putting them in you're binding the wound edges together so one of the major stages in wound healing is called bridging the wound so if you have a big cut and the skin, the epidermis is split apart. Unless you're holding the edges of this, this, the epidermis close together, it would take longer and longer and longer for the wound healing process to be completed. By putting stitches, you pull the, the edges of the wound together, which in, increases the rate at which bridging the wound can occur. And the cells that bridge the wound are cells in the stratum basally, by the way. Does that make sense? So stitches are like the same thing, like sterile strips, basically? Same, same thing. You could do those types of strips. Basically, you're holding the wound edges together, right? That's what stitches do. I mean, in some extreme conditions, you might have to have a surgeon go in there and stitch up a big artery if an artery got cut down in a, in a fat pad or something. But, you know, what you're doing with, you know, a simple stitching event is bringing the wound edges together, and clean it up, bring the wound edges together, and allow the skin to heal. Like I said, if someone has a fairly big cut and they don't go get stitches, 
they ultimately can, can just stay at home if they wanted to, and they could get the thing to heal. Now, how quickly and how well it heals, that, that's to be determined. Because if there is a hole in your skin, infectious agents get in there constantly. But if they can keep it clean and, you know, put some strips on it or, you know, tape it up. Like someone on a job site, they don't have anything. You can, man, it, you know, if they get a bad cut, they just put some duct tape around it real quick. I've seen people do that until they can go and get it cleaned up and get stitches and stuff. So technically you can hold your wound edges together at home. Even if it needs stitches, would need stitches, it can heal itself. It just takes longer. And you're at a higher risk of infection. So also, if you have a wound that keeps bleeding, ble the bleeding has to stop. The, 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 the surgeon and, and the physician has to get that bleeding to stop before they can stitch it up. If they can't get it to stop, they can't stitch it up because then they stitch it up and you're going to have all this bleeding underneath the stitched up skin. So all of that has to be gotten under control before that happens, right? All right, good question. All right, let's move forward and look at some of the cells that are in the epidermis. There's four cell types you have to know. 90% of all the cells that are in the epidermis are called keratinocytes. These are the cells that I'm referring to when I say the cells at the bottom divide. They get pushed upward. They then change, they get pushed upward, they change, they get pushed upward through our whole life. The keratinocytes are the majority of all the cells that make up the epidermis. And all of the keratinocytes in the stratum lucidum and the stratum corneum, all of these, by the time they get here, all those cells are dead. Their main job is protection. They help make our skin water resistant. Your skin's not waterproof. It's water resistant because if you pour water on your skin, obviously it just pours, it, it, it just trickles right off. However, if you go sit in a tub for a long time and then get out, your fingers are all wrinkled up. You're all pruny. That's because you had osmosis. Water goes through your skin. It just takes a while to do it, but it is, it makes it, the keratin makes it what we call water resistant. All of that comes from the keratinocytes. Now we have these other cells, uh, and I want you to know a little bit about what they do. The melanocytes are the cells that produce our skin pigment, melanin. Now there's a couple of different forms of melanin, but this is the name of the main skin pigment. It's not the only pigment that gives our skin our color and the different shades of color that we all are. We have other types of pigments that can be um, concentrated in, say, the stratum corneum of our skin. Some people have more yellowy tones. Uh, that's because of carotenoids, keratins. Uh, uh, some people have more red tones in their skin. That's because they have less dark melanin, and it makes the superficial layers of our epidermis pretty much clear. You might not know it, but the epidermis that has very little dark melanin granules in it, the epidermis is pretty much clear. You can see through it. So people that have more red tones in their skin, that means they have a lighter epidermis. And what you're really seeing, the redness is the blood in the blood vessels running in the dermis of the skin. Pretty crazy. So you, obviously we have lighter skinned individuals, darker skinned individuals. It's all genetic. How much melanin do we make? What version of melanin do we make? Do you make the more yellow reddish one? Do you make the more brown black one? It's all genetics, right? Now, the thing about melanocytes, though, is they are sensitive to UV radiation. So if we go out into the sun and UV radiation hits our, our, our epidermis, the melanocytes, which typically hang out towards the bottom, just around the basally and just into the stratum spinosal layer, um, they start to make more melanin because of UV radiation. And we call that a tan. So if you go lay out and you're trying to get your skin to become darker or whatever, that's because your melanocytes are the, really the enzyme uh, in your skin called tyrosinase, which makes melanin. It increases when UV light hits it. So we start to increase the rate at which we make melanin and you start, your skin gets a little darker. 
That's a protective mechanism against UV radiation, by the way. Darker skinned individuals can stay out in UV radiation longer than lighter skinned individuals without getting skin damage. Because the SPF of melanin is high if you have a lot of it, but it's low if you only have a little of it, right? So you're gonna learn more about that in, in the lecture class though. All right, so melanocytes make our skin pigment melanin. We also have tactile receptors. Remember, I just said that word a while ago. Tactile uh, receptors are receptors that allow you to feel touch, vibration, and pressure. All right, we call that tactile stimulation. So there is a tactile epithelial cell. It's located near the stratum basally. It's called a Merkel cell right here. And a Merkel cell makes contact with a nerve ending so that when you have pressure applied to the skin, that cell is compressed and it triggers a nerve firing saying you feel something. So that's tactile stimulation. We also have some specialized macrophages, which you, you might have only heard of that name once so far, but macrophages are produced from basically white blood cells, a type of white blood cell, and they're phagocytic. It's the largest of the phagocytes in our body. And um, the, the ones in your epidermis are called intraepithelial macrophages. This prefix intra right here means within. So within the epithelial layers, all these layers, we have these special macrophages. The other name for them, which is a name we really go by forever, is, are called the Langerhans cells. So the Langerhans cells are dendritic cells that have the ability to recognize when pathogens are trying to infect our skin and get into our body. And so what they do is they help alert our immune system cells to trigger immune responses. So they aid in immunity. They don't bring about the immunity, but they aid in allowing our immune responses to occur. All right, let's talk about the dermis just a little bit and then we'll get into all the pictures so you can start seeing what this stuff looks like, right? So the dermis is the deepest part of our skin directly. So when I say skin, the skin is made of two main areas. It's made of the more superficial epidermis, which is a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium below the epidermis, which means it would be below the stratum basally, is the dermis. The dermis has two primary layers to it. The most superficial layer of the dermis, which is directly beneath the stratum basally of the epidermis. So just below the stratum basally, about 20% of the dermis, we can find some areolar connective tissue there. You got some collagen fibers all running in there, but the, we have areolar connective tissue. You remember that from uh, last week or the week before? So that we can find areolar connective tissue just below the epidermis in what's called the papillary region of the dermis, right? We also have some blood vessel loops in there, some capillary loops. Remember the epidermis is avascular. So all of the blood is running in blood vessels that are located in the dermis. Now, the deeper part of the dermis is called the reticular region. The reticular layer or region, it comp comprises about 80% of the dermis. And there's a whole bunch of different structures in the dermis. The blood, vessel, blood vessels are a little bigger. They're smaller. The more superficial you go into the dermis, ultimately up here in the papillary region, these are capillaries, which are small. You get deep in, or start going into the reticular layer, the blood vessels get a little bigger. You go even deeper, they get a little bigger. You go deeper, they get even, even bigger until you go below the skin, which is called the hypodermis. And that's where they're the biggest. That's where you have your big arteries and veins running below your skin. Now, the, the reticular region also contains uh, a whole bunch of different glands in there we're going to learn about. Hair follicles, at least where we do have hair. Um, and we only have hair, by the way, in thin skin. So you would only see hair follicles 
in thin skin. You would not see hair follicles in thick skin. So there's no hair follicles on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. That's where we have thick skin. Now you can have hair everywhere else on your body, which is where thin skin is located. So we have hair follicles in there and we're gonna look at that. You have oil glands called sebaceous glands. You have sweat glands called pseudoriferous glands. You have tactile receptors, free nerve endings, blood vessels, all sorts of things in there, right? So we're gonna look at what these are. So let's, I don't wanna go through everything on here. This is, this is the workbook picture I was telling you about. So you can do these at home and that's, you would have to look up in that appendix, you would look up figure 3.1a in that appendix file I showed you earlier. And you can see what number one is, what number two is, what number three is. So I typically don't go through and say, okay, number one is a sweat pour. Number two is a stratum corneum. Number three is a hair shaft. I don't do that. This is your homework. Go and learn how to identify the structures on your models, right? And then if you ever have a question on it, that's when you get in touch with me. So you're going to be learning how to, how to identify these things. So let me just show you what you're looking at. This is just one of the skin models. Like I said, there is another one. Um, I don't think I have a picture of it in my book. No, I don't. Um, but there is the picture of that older skin model in the Quizlet that I posted the link to in our exercise four module. So you can go through there and see that. So let me just show you a few things and how this, what the structure of the skin really is. So basically what we just did in terms of text information is we went through the layers of the epidermis. So that's what number 21 is trying to point to right here. So this, from this, you see how it's wavy, by the way? We have these little waves. So the bottom layer of the epidermis is not flat. They have these little waves in it. Now, these waves are more exaggerated on, the, on your fingertips on, and your palm and your toes and the sole of your foot. Because on your fingertips, it's called, you have what are called fingerprints, right? And so these little waves that, go, that make the epidermis go upward like that are actually caused by these little bumps in the dermis. These bumps are called dermal papillae. A papilla is a bulgy section like this. That's a papilla, right? A little bump is a papilla. Now on the fingertips, those dermal papilla are, uh, papillae, plural, are exaggerated. They're, they're bigger. They go more up like this even though they don't show it on this model. So if this dermal papilla was bigger, it goes without saying that the epidermis that covers it would also go up higher right there. And so it forms what we call epidermal ridges at the surface of our body on our fingertips. And we call those fingerprints. So here's the epidermis, the stratum basally at the bottom. You see how it's a little darker layer here? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. So that one little cell there, right there, boom, that's the stratum basally. So then you go up the next layer you get to is the stratum, uh, stratum spinosum right there. The next layer you get to is called the stratum granulosum. And I know this model is not correct because they do put this little yellow layer here, which is representing the stratum lucidum but the stratum lucidum is not located on any skin that has hair in it. And notice on the model, there's hair follicles right here. So, but don't worry about that. There, it's just trying to show you that there are these, these main layers to the skin. And then the most superficial layer is the stratum corneum. So you see how thick that is. This is all dead skin cells right here, by the way, right there, stratum corneal uh, layer protects us. So if you go down, you have the lucidal layer, you have the granulosal layer, the spinosal layer, and then this little layer at the bottom is the stratum basally, right? Now, the dermis itself is everything below the epidermis, but 
above what we call the hypodermis. The hypodermis is mainly made up, it has, there's some areolar tissue down here, but it's mainly made up of a fat pad. So all of the yellow that you see in this model, that's adipose tissue, by the way. So we have a fat pad that is at the bottom of our, our dermis, all right? Some people have a thicker fat pad than others at, down there. So it just depends on your, uh, your, your body shape and what, what, what's happening, how much energy you're storing, how much energy you're using. Um, so I didn't, it doesn't look like a separate. So this is all dermis right here on the model. So only this little layer right below the epidermis about that much is called the reticular, um, it's called the papillary region. So from about here up to the bottom of the epidermis is the papillary region. The rest of it all the way down is called the reticular region. So let's look at some of the structures in here, right? First of all, some of the glands. These little squiggly lines that you see right here, this white tubular thing, and it looks like it's all kind of twisted up in there, convoluted, that's a sweat gland. That's a sudoriferous gland. This is the duct of a sweat gland, of the sudoriferous gland. Sudoriferous glands are exocrine glands, right? Because they have a duct that transports their product to the site of action, which in this case would be perspiration, goes to the surface of our skin. This one in particular is called an ecrine sweat gland. An ecrine sweat gland, because we have two major types of sweat glands, apocrine and ecrine. Um, I'm gonna show you, well, I might not have the picture of that one. Well, um, I, I'll try and find the picture of the other one in a minute, but ecrine sweat glands are the, most numerous, they're found all over the place, and these are in, uh, on your body, and these are involved in thermal regulation. So if you're running on a treadmill in a gym and you're getting hot and you start to sweat, um, some people sweat more than others, that's kind of genetic, but if you start to sweat, it's mainly due to these sweat glands producing perspiration, the ecrine sweat glands. Now, if you notice this structure right here, this is a gland, this is an oil gland or sebaceous gland. You'll always know if you're looking at a sebaceous gland because the ones that you're going to be identifying are always associated with a hair follicle. So here's a hair follicle right here. So you see this is the gland, same thing over here. That's another one. This is a sebaceous gland. Sebaceous glands produce sebum, which is a science name for oil. So ultimately it's secreted out onto your hairs to the surface of the skin. So these equine sweat glands go straight to the top. These, these oil glands or sebaceous glands kind of link up with a hair right here. Now let's look at some of the tactile receptors that we see. Well, first of all, let me show you this. We have free nerve endings. So that's what this little yellow is trying to, is trying to show you. We have free nerve endings in there. So thermal receptors that monitor temperature are free nerve endings. Um, pain receptors, which are called nociceptors, are free nerve endings. But notice some of the, the little yellow lines go to a little specific structure. See these little bitty circular structures up here? These are tactile receptors that are very specific. These are called Meisner corpuscles. Meisner corpuscles are located in the dermal papilla which are in the papillary region of the dermis. So that's where that receptor is located. These are superficial tactile receptors, so we can feel light touches on our skin. So if you have something that's barely touching your skin, you feel it because of these Meisner corpuscles are firing to the brain saying you feel a light touch. We also have free nerve endings that go to our hair follicles, the hair bulb in the dermis of the skin. Here's a hair follicle right here, right? The bulb. So you have these little nerve endings that go to the hair. And for that reason, if you go to touch a hair on your body, like if you have a hair on your arm or something and you touch it without touching your skin, don't press on your skin, just barely touch the hair and you can feel it. Why can I feel it even though I'm not directly touching the skin? 
because when you wiggle the hair back and forth, it makes these free nerve endings fire to the brain, saying that the hair is moving and you feel it. So this is another type of tactile sensory receptor. It's called a hair root root complex. A hair root complex. So you move the hair, you feel it. That's the bottom line, right? We also have uh, some deep pressure receptors, some deep tactile sensitive receptors. And this one, they show it way up here. I'm gonna show you a picture out of the book in a minute. Um, but, and so this receptor, notice it has little layers in it. It's kind of cut open. The artist at a model cut it open. And it almost looks like an onion. You know how you, if you cut an onion open, it has these layers in it? So this receptor is called a pacinian, with a P, pacinian corpuscle. The little one up here in a dermal papillae is called a Meisner corpuscle. This one is called a pacinian corpuscle. Um, the other name for that is called a lamellated corpuscle. It's called a lamellated because it has layers in it. And lamella in Latin means layer. So nonetheless, this is called a pacinian corpuscle. They can be found at the bottom regions of the reticular layer of the dermis and sometimes just into the hypodermis, which this model obviously is not showing that. So you, we have smaller blood vessels high up in the dermis. The deeper we go, we have larger blood vessels, right? Then at the very bottom of the dermis, we have our fat pad down here. That's called the hypodermis, which number 13 is pointing to, or is called the subcutaneous layer. So the word subcutaneous means literally below skin. The word hypodermis literally means below dermis. So both terms can be used for this. So below the skin, we have this layer that's called subcutaneous. Below the dermis, it's the same name, it's called hypodermis, all right? All right, so that's one of the skin models. This is the same model, an up close picture of it. Uh, the same exact model I just when I took the picture I think I focused down on this section over here so you can go through that and start learning those structures so let me show you some of the glands in the skin and then I'll pull up that PowerPoint all right now in fact in about when I get done with this we're gonna take a slight break um, uh, usually if we're in lab I usually give people about a 10 minute break um, after we go through some of the material and then we'll come back and we'll finish up. But let me show you some of the slides that I used to use while we were face to face in the lab that I put in the book. So if we look in the middle, this slide is on a low power. You see the 40X lens on the microscope. And so at the very top of the slide, field of view up here, where you see this purple area, that is the epidermis on low power, right? Just up there. So below this purple layer right there, all of this pink or whatever, you know, right here, whatever color that is, with all the stuff in between, this is all the dermis right here. So all of that is dermis. And at the very top, only that colored layer is the epidermis. Now, if we focus down on this section of the dermis right here, I can see two different types of glands in this one field of view right here. So what I did is I increased the magnification so we could see it better. But I'll just tell you, on low power, this is a sebaceous gland. This is a pseudoriferous gland. And I'm gonna show you how we know that. So if we focus and increase the magnification and look up here, look, now we can see the difference in them. Look at this picture. This gland right here on an even higher magnification from this section of the picture is this gland. So look at this gland right here. You kind of see the nuclei everywhere the, and you can see like the, dis, the, dis, the distinction, sorry, of the cells. And they kind of look clear in there, don't they? That's because these cells are making oil. So all of these cells 
are sebaceous gland cells. That's one reason why I know it, because you kind of see there a clear area in them. Even on low power, it's kind of clear in there. A little bit higher power, you see it's kind of clear still in there, and a higher power is still kind of clear um, in there relative to this. So look at this one. This one, you see these little dark purple loops in it. You see them little circles? Kind of darker purple, little circles in there. Let me show you what those are. And then all of a sudden, you see this little strip going up. This is a sweat duct the duct of the pseudoriferous gland right there. This is the gland itself. And look, here's another one. These dark purple little circles in there all over. So let me show you why we see these little circles. Let me go back to the model. Look at this gland. Number 10 is pointing to an eccrine sweat gland, a pseudoriferous gland. Look at the gland is kind of tubular, right? So if you take and cut this gland in half, and look at it under a microscope, you're gonna see each little part of each little tube. And that's exactly what we're looking at right here with these little circles, right? Now, the other thing that you can notice is that depending on how the skin section was, was cut, sebaceous glands are gonna be around a hair follicle. So here's a hair follicle they don't show the whole piece just because of the way it's cut, but that's where a hair would be. That oil gland would be associated with it. Um, this is a hair follicle and the hair has been, uh, artificially it's been plucked out of there because of fixing the slide. But on this higher magnification, look at the epidermis at the top. You see how we had that little wave again, I showed you on the model, that would be the stratum basally. Um, this all is epidermis up here. And then below that is all dermis, right? Oh, I need to show you this on the model as well before I move forward. Look at this hair follicle right here. There's a little muscle that is associated with a hair follicle. That little muscle, there's one there. Here's a little piece of the muscle over here. That little muscle is called an erector pili muscle. Erector pili muscle. Erector, because when the muscle contracts, it makes the hair stand up. And a pilus, singular, in Latin means hair. Pili is plural, many hairs. So the muscle that makes you have goosebumps and then causes your hair to stand up is the erector pili muscle. So look on this slide. Oh, here it is again. There's your erector pili muscle, and you see the sebaceous gland associated with the hair. Here's an erector pili muscle right here on this slide, right there. That's muscle tissue right there, by the way. Here it is on a higher magnification. And you know how you're going to know that? We haven't done this yet, but this is smooth muscle. And smooth muscle have these elongated, it'll be kind of pink in here, and it'll have these elongated nuclei like this, right? And you'll always see it somewhere around a sebaceous gland or near the hair follicle itself. So here's, here's the, the erector pili right here coming from the hair follicle right there, right? All right, here are a couple other pictures of some skin. Um, obviously, this is a thin skin that I've just showed you because thin skin is the only skin that has hair follicles in it. All right, um, this is thick skin. There's no hair follicles in it. Now, this is a slide of a lighter skinned individual. I know that because towards the stratum basally, here's on low magnification. From here up is all epidermis. From here down is all dermis. If I increase the magnification of that, now from here up, I can see the epidermis a little better. Below that is dermis, right? So if we look at the stratum basally, which is just the very bottom layer, and I often get students saying, well, how can I tell the difference between the layers? I'm gonna tell you how easy it is to identify these layers, by the way. If you know the, the layers in order, 
and you have to anyway, and you have a pointer pointing at the bottom of the epidermis like that, and it asks you what layer of the epidermis that is. Well, even if you can't tell the difference between the cell layers in here, if it's pointing to the very bottom, your best guess is stratum basally because it's at the bottom. Now, if it's somewhat a little away from the bottom in the middle in this, in this layer, that's always going to be the stratum spinosum because that's the next layer up. And often, the easiest couple layers to identify besides the location of those two, the stratum granulosum starts to get a little darker because there's granules in there containing coretta hyaline that's staying dark. So that layer is called the stratum granulosum, right? Now, the next layer, you know, depending on the slide, we would see a stratum lucidum. Kind of don't see it on here. So what I did on this slide is all of these cells at the top, they don't even look like cells anymore. Kind of just look like fibers, huh? But that's not fibers. That's dead skin cells. All of that is a stratum corneum, right? Now, if we look at this picture, this is a picture of the epidermis again, with part of the dermis down here, of a darker skinned individual. You know how I know that? Because if we look at the very bottom of the epidermis, and notice how we have, it goes up and down, like I showed you before, if you look, it kind of has these brownish tint to it down here. That's because in these deeper layers of the epidermis, the melanocytes are producing more melanin down here. But nonetheless, this is all epidermis right here. This is all dermis right here, right? Now, we can see a couple other slides of it. Here's a, a slide showing the skin. I focused down on some sudoriferous glands. You can see how it's kind of purple with the little circles in it. So if you ever see that, you know you're looking at a sudoriferous gland, right? This is a duct that's gonna lead from the gland. Here's a piece of the duct right here that would come from this gland. So that's just another picture of some pseudoriferous glands. Um, here's a, 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 sl a slide of skin that shows Meisner corpuscles in a dermal papilla. This is the epidermis at the top. Oh, also, you could tell where all the dead cells are because it kind of looks like this clear stuff up here. This is all the stratum corneum up here, by the way. So from the bottom of this colored region right here to the top is the epidermis. Below that is dermis. So if we focus down on it, in the dermal papillae, there are little circular structures. I'm gonna show you a better picture of it in a minute. Little circular structures that are located inside of these dermal papilla. Those are the Meisner corpuscles right there. Those are, they, they allow for, for light touches to be sensed, by the way. All right, so that's it for this little packet. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Share my screen again. All right, do you guys see this PowerPoint? Yeah. Yes. All right, very, very good. All right, so here's the integumentary system. Uh, PowerPoint, and you notice that I, I didn't put any pointers on it. It's just pictures to show you, and, and a, a lot of these come from the textbook. Like this is the picture from the textbook, and in chapter five of your textbook, the lecture book for lecture, and in there you can see some pointers all over the place, so you can refer to that. But let me show you what we're looking at. First of all, on this graphic, from this very bottom layer of cells that we were looking at before, kind of in this wavy pattern, that's the stratum basally at the bottom. So from here up is, this, is the epidermis, the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. From the lighter region, see below the little wave, it gets lighter or different coloration, all the way down to the fat pad is the dermis. So from here down is dermis. The epidermis is avascular. All epithelial tissues are avascular. 
the part of a hair that we see on the outside of our body is called the shaft, by the way. We have a hair follicle with the bulb. It's embedded in the dermis of the skin and the hair grows. The hair, by the way, along with the sebaceous glands, here's one associated with the hair, and the sudoriferous glands, which produce that perspiration, these are actually epidermal derivatives, or what I wrote in the packet as dermal derivatives. Technically, they're, they're you know, made up, at least the hair is made up of both, but what makes a hair, you know what a hair really is? Dead epidermal cells. Fingernails and toenails are dead epidermal cells. So hair, fingernails and toenails are, are compacted, highly dense compacted epidermal cells. And remember all epidermal cells come from the stratum basally. So these, um, hair, nails, and whatnot are made from epidermal cells. So they're living in certain parts and then they die. So our, the, what we see on the outside of the body for the hair is all dead. Now over here to the left, you see the dermal papilla, they, the little ridges that go up and down, that forces the ridges in the epidermis, which are called epidermal ridges. They're exaggerated on your fingertips and they're called fingerprints. You see the little Meissner corpuscles up here in the dermal papillae. Those are tactile sensitive receptors. Free nerve endings going to the hair follicle, the hair root complex. You see a little muscle attached to the hair follicle and, and the bulb. That's the erector pili muscle, causes goosebumps, and it makes the hair stand up erect on our body. That aids in blocking us blocking the loss of heat from your body. When, when you're cold, this muscle will contract, which is supposed to raise the hairs up, and it makes an air barrier. So air can't get down and touch the surface of your skin as easily. Because we lose heat from the surface of our skin through radiation. As air hits your skin, the air picks up the heat and pulls it off of your body. And that's what makes you cold. So people that don't have hair on their head, like bald individuals, they have to wear a, a hat in the, in the winter because their scalp gets really cold. And people that have hair, the scalp doesn't get as cold because the air doesn't get and touch the skin on the scalp as easily because the person has hair on their head. All right, so also notice this. This little structure down here is the Pacinian corpuscle. So Pacinian corpuscles are located in the deeper parts of the reticular region of the dermis and just into the hypodermis or subcutaneous layer. So here's our fat pad, all right? All right, so let's just go through some of these pictures. First of all, this is a graphic from your book. Most of these pictures are from the book, some of them aren't, but let's look at the graphic first and let's identify some of this stuff. The very bottom cell layer, notice they're not flat and neither of these up in here until you start getting to the top. But these are kind of cuboidal to small columnar shaped cells. Just this very bottom layer down here, um, not that one, but the rest of, and not this one, but the rest of these are the cells that turn into the, all these keratinocytes that form the epidermis. So we get cell division. So from the very bottom, this is the artist drew this showing mitosis, the cell dividing. So as these cells from the bottom divide, it pushes all the cells that are here upward. So those make up the majority of all the cells in here. This little cell at the bottom right here is a melanocyte. The little dots you see are granules with the dark pigment melanin in it. And that melanin gets distributed into the other cells around in the deeper regions of the epidermis. Um, this is a Merkel cell that makes contact with a free nerve ending. So if we have pressure from the top of our epidermis, you're touching something or something's touching you, it compresses all these cells and presses down on the Merkel cell and makes this neuron, the little free nerve ending fire. This large cell in the middle is a Langerhans cell or that intraepithelial uh, macrophage that I mentioned earlier. 
So these kind of move around in our, in our epidermis and they signify our immune system cells when we have a, a microbe trying to infect our skin. So here are the layers, the stratum basally at the bottom. From here up to here is a stratum spinosum. Then you see these three to five rows of cells right here with the dark little dots in it. Those little granules have keratohyalin. They're gonna turn into keratin protein. That's a stratum granulosum. Just above that, in thick skin, you would have the stratum lucidum. So the artist kind of drew them clear. And above them, you have the stratum corneum, which is the thickest of the epidermis. Now, all of the cells at the top after the granulosal layer are all dead. The lucidal cells are dead. The uh, corneal cells are all dead. So the last place that we have living cells are in the stratum granulosum. Now look at this real photomicrograph over here. You can see all the layers again. So here's the dermis down here. You see all the collagen fibers. Ooh, this is a really good picture. I just noticed that. Look very closely in this. This is the dermal papillae. See how it goes up? Now look right here, this structure. It has some organization to it. Like it has these little loops in it with clear spots in it. You see that? This is a Meisner corpuscle. See how it's got a little bit of organization to it relative to all of the other fibers that are around it? Sometimes they're harder to see, sometimes they're not. But I'm going to tell you this. If there is a pointer pointing in a dermal papilla and it's asking you for that structure that's right there, that is a Meisner corpuscle, right? Even if you can't determine that it is. That's a Meisner, unless it's asking you for the dermal papilla. You know, just read the question carefully because some students were answering certain things and I gave them credit, but they just didn't read the questions carefully. It was asking for a specific thing, but they wrote around what, about what it was, so I gave credit. So let's look at the, the epidermis. The very bottom layer, now notice right here, I mean, it, you would be hard pressed to say, okay, that's a different layer from all of these cells, right? So the difference is if there is a pointer right here, only at the bottom, you have to call that stratum basally. If there's a pointer in the middle right there or right here, you have to call that stratum spinosum. Now notice when you start getting above that, it starts getting little granules in there. <clears throat> and it even gets darker right here. That's the stratum granulosum right there. And then all of a sudden, above the stratum granulosum, we have this area. That's the stratum lucidum and into the layers of the corneum. Now, it sometimes is hard to determine depending on the coloration, but if it is above the granulosal layer, but only slightly like that. You're going to call it the stratum lucidum. I got a better picture to show you in a minute. And if it's higher up and you still see that it's all the dead cell layers, notice you can't see from here up. You can't see the distinction between any cells. It kind of looks like fibrous material, right? It's not like you see the little distinctions between all the cells like down here. You don't see any nuclei anywhere up here. That means all those cells are dead. They're filled with keratin. Look at this picture. Here's a picture from the bottom. Now you see it's a little bit darker down here. The melanocytes are down there. That's a stratum basally. From here up to here is a stratum spinosum. Notice where it gets a little darker. Stratum granulosum. From there up is going to be the corneal layer on thin skin. All right, so look over here. Same thing, a picture I showed you earlier. Here's a Meisner corpuscle in here. There's one right there. You kind of see this little circular looking structure. So from the very bottom layer right there, and notice how it goes up, that little bottom layer right there is the stratum basally. All of this is spinosum. 
where it gets a little darker is the granuloso layer, all of that. Then from there up, it, you can't really make out cells at all. That's all dead skin, dead epidermal cells. That's a corneal layer. Now look at this layer. This is a really good picture that shows all five layers, by the way. So down here, you could determine dermis. See how the coloration is darker all up here? Then all of a sudden between this, this distinction, it gets a little lighter. Same thing over here. You kind of see it's, it's darker, but below that it's lighter. So all of the darker region is always epidermis, right? And you'll see a whole bunch of cells because you see all the nuclei everywhere. And then below that's dermis. That's all the collagen fibers down there. So look, at the very bottom, if it's pointing to the bottom, that's a stratum basally. If it's pointing somewhere up here, but below the next darker layer, that's the stratum spinosum. Then at the darker layer, where you see the little kind of little granules in there, that's the stratum granulosum. Now look here, this is a pretty good stain slide because all of this, where it's kind of clear, but you don't see any cells. You don't see any nuclei in here. That's because all the cells are dead. That's the stratum lucidum, all right there. But above it, you st are all still dead, dead epidermal cells. That's a stratum corneum, right? Now over here, you can see, uh, you know, if they had pointers on it, again, if it's only on the very bottom right here, that's the basally layer. If it's in the middle, that's the stratum spinosum. And just before you get to where you can't make out cells anymore, the last little layer of cells, even if you can't tell it's darker or not, is called the stratum granulosum. So when you get above that, and it kind of looks like just a mesh of fibers, that is a stratum corneum. All right, so let's look at thin skin. Here's a diagram, of a, a, a photomicrograph of thin skin, same thing over here. This is a hair follicle. I know those are hair follicles. Big structures like this, when you see them, even though like in this one, you can see the hair. Upon fixation, and here's a piece of the hair right here. Upon fixation, these hairs are, are removed. That's just an artifact. But I know this is a hair follicle. I know this is a hair follicle. And look, this gland right here, that's a sebaceous gland. Remember how it's kind of clear in the middle? It's always associated with a hair follicle. Well, look at this one. The hair follicle, you could barely see it. It would come up through an angle of some sort through the section, but look how it's clear around it. That is a piece of a, a sebaceous gland right there. Now look at this one. Here's a hair follicle. Here's the hair that's still intact in the section. And look at this, this is the sebaceous gland. Now you can see the little cells in there with the nuclei and they kind of look clear. They're making oil. This is a sebaceous gland associated with the follicle. So whenever you see that, even if you don't know, uh, man, I don't remember. The gland that is associated with a hair follicle is a sebaceous gland, all right? And then the epidermis is all at the top. Of course, on low power, they're not gonna point to and identify the layer unless it's the very bottom one or something, but they might say, okay, what layer of the skin is this? You would have to say epidermis. What layer of the skin is this? Oh, that's dermis, right? Here's another layer of the skin over here. The dermis is at the bottom. The epidermis is from the darker region up. So the stratum basally is at the bottom. Above that would be stratum spinosum above that just before it gets all kind of but where you don't see any more cells is a stratum granulosum and then from there up depending on if it's thick or thin skin you, you have the lucidum and then the corneal layer this one looks like this is the corneal layer but i can't be positive with the stain same thing over here you have the dermis down here you have the stratum basally right here above that from here to here is stratum spinosum stratum granulosum as it starts to get darker. Can y'all start seeing a trend here? And then up here is all the superficial dead layer cells, corneal layer, whatnot, the lucidal layer, corneal layers. 
Here's just a picture of, uh, I'm not sure if they're gonna have pictures on the test like this, but these are the four main cells in the epidermis. Um, this is the 90% of them are these, the keratinocytes. And all these fibers represent keratin fibers that get loaded down inside the cell. This is a melanocyte that makes melanin. This is that macrophage, a Langerhans cell. And that's a Merkel cell is always associated with that, that free nerve. Here's a picture that shows melanocytes producing melanin. It's all brown at the bottom. So all that little brown you see is a dark melanin pigment that would be made by the melanocytes that are in the deepest layers of the epidermis. Um, here they show the skin again, which we already went through and we went through this picture. So I won't waste time doing that. Same thing with this picture. Um, we already went through this model, so make sure you review it in the Quizlet and or in the models book. Same thing with this, same model. And then Meisner corpuscles. This is the slide I wanted to show you. Oh, this is the one we already saw. But there's a couple of slides here that show the Meisner corpuscle. Here's the dermal papilla right here. Inside of it is this circular, really oval, oblong structure but it has some organization to it. So you got little spirals in it relative to the tissue around it. Notice there's no spirals here, but right here, you see it. Same thing over here, look at this side. Here's the dermal papilla right here. And now you can see this little oval shaped structure right there. It's got a little organization to it relative to the tissue around it or around it over here. There's nothing. But so those little structures that are up in the dermal papilla are Meisner corpuscles. Here's another one, the one I already showed you, that little circular structure, this little circular structure over here, just another slide showing some Meisner corpuscles. Um, what else did I wanna show you on here? So I'll put this PowerPoint in our packet. It just kind of shows the models and everything again. Um, oh, here's a Pacinian corpuscle. You may have a Pacinian corpuscle slide. So let me show you what the slide looks like. There's a couple of ways we could look at it. This is a transverse section right here. Almost looks like a tree that's been cut down with the layers. So you see the little layers in here. These are called concentric lamellae. This is a Meisner corpuscle in one section. This is a longitudinal section where you see the layers long ways. So right here, I don't know if they're gonna, they'll probably use a different slide, but the identifying character for this are all, all of these layers that make it look like an onion. These are the lamellated corpuscles, which are called my, uh, Pacinian corpuscles. These are deep in the skin at the junction of the reticular layer of the dermis down here and the hypodermis. So here's a Pacinian corpuscle. You kind of see the little, the little layers in there, little circles. So that's how you're gonna identify that, by the way. Oh, here's that older model. I'm glad it's in here. So let me show you what you're looking at on this older model, um, since it's not in my book, real quick. All right, first of all, this, this was an older model of the, of the skin. Uh, I just didn't have a picture of it at the time. So, there's different sections on here. The section on this model where you see the hairs is, is thin skin. This would be thin skin all over our body. Then over here where there's no hair follicles would be thick skin. So let's look at the epidermis. The epidermis is this bottom layer all the way to the top. The bottom layer all the way to the top. So on thick skin, you have all five layers. The very bottom layer is the basally. Right there in the middle is the spinosal layer. Just above that where it changes color is the granulosal layer, stratum granulosum. And notice right here, that little thin line right there on this model represents the stratum lucidum. Above that, the thickest part is the stratum corneum, right? So that stratum corneum is thicker on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And by the way, the skin is the thinnest on your eyelids, by the way. But nonetheless, and that inclu includes the whole 
area of the skin, the dermis and the epidermis. So if you look down here, this would be the basally layer. Just above that would be spinosome. Just above that where it gets darker is the granulosome. Now, since this is thin skin, this layer is not the lucidum layer. This layer at the very top is the stratum corneum because it's on thin skin. So notice we have hair follicles everywhere. We have sebaceous glands associated with the hair follicle. You have little muscles that attach to the hair follicle. Those are called erector pili muscles. And you have the Meisner corpuscles, which are up in the dermal papilla, these little circular structures, oval structures, that's the Meisner corpuscle. Deep down here on this model, this is the Pacinian corpuscle down here. That's a deep pressure sensitive receptor or a deep tactile receptor. These little white squiggly looking glands right here are the eccrine sweat glands. These are the ones that are the most numerous and they are involved in thermal regulation. So that's the gland, the pseudoriferous gland. This is the pseudoriferous gland duct. And as the duct reaches the surface of the skin, it opens up as the sweat pore or the pseudoriferous gland pore, but you can just call it sweat pore if you want. This is where sweat pours out of the tube onto the surface of the skin. Now, what is this weird looking structure here? So this is why I wanted to show you this model because this gland is not on the other model that we went through. This gland is an apocrine sweat gland. Apocrine. An apocrine sweat gland is not involved in thermal regulation per se. However, if you've ever gotten really, really nervous and the palms of your hands start to get cold and clammy, kind of moist, or maybe you start sweating more under your armpit. That is the perspiration produced by these glands. Now these can, can produce that perspiration as well, but these apocrine sweat glands are typically found in your armpits, in the pubic region, and in the areolar around the nipple of the mammary glands, a breast on a female and in, in the face of bearded men. That's where the apocrine sweat glands are located. So these glands actually produce sweat when we are going through a nervous reaction, when we're nervous, or during sexual intercourse, sexual arousal. These glands produce their perspiration. Um, so those are called apocrine sweat glands. All right, um, let's see. We have a few other pictures here I wanted to show you real quick before we move on and get finished. Uh, this is a slide showing the skin, obviously, the epidermis at the top from the darker part all the way to the top epidermis. Below that is all dermis. This slide specifically is showing a bunch of sweat glands, pseudoriferous glands. And I know that because look, there's these dark little circles again that I mentioned before. Remember, you see these dark little circles those are these which are cut open right here. So they're just stained. And then this little line that leads from it, that's the, that's the duct. That's the gland duct that is leading from the gland right there. So you see these, you know you're looking at pseudoriferous glands, all right? Now let's look at the sebaceous glands. Again, here it is. I showed you this picture already. I thought they had different ones, but... They may have it in your pre and post lab assignments. So here you see the gland is kind of clearish in the middle. It's associated with a hair follicle right here. That's a sebaceous gland. This is a sebaceous gland. Over here, that little piece right there is kind of clear in the middle. That's a sebaceous gland. I also see erector pili muscles on this slide. Look at this darker line right here, leading from the hair follicle and going upward. That is an erector pili muscle right there. Same thing right here. You see this little strip going up? That's a piece of an erector pili muscle on this slide, by the way. Um, here, 
we see this is a really good picture of it. Here's a sebaceous gland. You see how it's associated with the hair follicle, has the hair inside of it. Um, and it, so it releases sebum to the surface of your, your skin along your hair, the base of your hair, right? Keeps your skin kind of water resistant. It keeps your hair moist and pliable, uh, you know, prevents it from being dehydrated because oil and water doesn't mix. It, it creates a water barrier here. All right, the other types of glands that we don't have pictures of that are associated with the skin are called ser uh, the ceruminous glands, ceruminous glands, and the mammary glands. Ceruminous glands are the are modified glands in your ear canal. Those are the glands that produce earwax. So the science name for earwax in your ear canal is called cerumen, cerumen, and then mammary glands, which are on you know the female reproductive system, produce milk so the babies can eat. So these are all associated glands with the skin. All right. Um, I think that's about it that I wanted to show you. You can look at the hair follicle picture in your book. Um, there's different layers to the hair follicle. They may make you identify this. So I'll just go through some of the layers. You won't remember them, but it's labeled in your book. Um, we have what is called a dermal sheath. So this is extensions of collagen fibers that form around the hair bulb. It's called a dermal sheath. And then we have epidermal sheaths. We have an external epidermal sheath right here and an internal epidermal sheath in here. You have a cuticle, just like you do on your fingernails. You have a cuticle of the hair that's this layer. You have a cortex of the hair itself, which is this layer. You have a medulla, which is this layer in the middle. And then that one little cell layer right there is called the hair matrix. This is what's giving rise to the new cells that help form your hair along with these around it. And what's interesting here is in the hair matrix is where the melanocytes are located. Yep, the melanocytes are down here. These cells, by the way, are aggregates that come from the stratum basally during development. So we have melanocytes associated with this little layer called the matrix and so those are the cells that produce the color of your hair. It's kind of interesting. So some people have blonde hair. You know what complete blonde hair is? A hair with no color in it. Um, but then you have your different shades of blonde. A person that has black hair, they have the deepest and darkest amounts of dark black melanin that go through all of the hair. And then all the shades in between. How much melanin do you make? Do you make a lot of it? Do you make a little of it? What are the shades of the types of melanin you make? Is it dark or is it lighter? Is it red tones, right? So the difference in the type of our genetics, which you inherit your genes from your parents, you get different types of melanin produced. There's a darker brown black one. You might produce more of the brown version or somebody might produce more of the black version. There's a reddish, orangeyish, yellow, uh, yellow one. You might produce more of the yellow red one than you do the brown black one. It just depends on your genetics. So the layers of this hair are labeled in chapter five of your book. I forget what page it's on. You can just thumb through it. Um, and if you don't have it, then if you don't have your book, I'll try and go find the, the labeled picture and give it to you. I do have the layers of the hair follicle labeled on the model in, in, in the book though, all right? Um, also, I forgot to tell you, down here at the bottom where the little capillary bed's at that supplies the nutrients to the epidermal cells that form the hair, this is called the papilla. Remember, a bumped area is called the papilla. So this is the hair papilla right here. All right, so that's about it for that. What I want to do now is I need to stop sharing this. I need to 
go to our Canvas course. Let me share the screen. <clears throat> All right. So that's pretty much it for the skin chapter. What I wanted to do now is show you what you need to start working on as soon as you get done with going through everything in exercise four module. All right. So again, I put that PowerPoint we just looked at right here. I put the link for the Quizlets in here the answers to the figure exercises in this document is right here. So those are four new documents that I put in. Now, you still have to go, you know, make sure you go through the other learning resources to do your pre and post lab work, by the way. Oh, also complete your engaged quizzes. Some people aren't doing that. You need to make sure you do that. For next week specifically, we're going over the appendicular skeleton. So on the next practical, which is in a couple of weeks, we're going to cover the, the terminology from homework one module, exercise four module, and exercise five module. So what I did this morning is I put, again, this is the same link, the same Quizlet. So when you click on that, you're going to go to the Quizlet page, and you just have to scroll down until you start seeing the models you're trying to learn. I put in the chapter, again, with the figure, the answers to the figure numbers. I put my old lab manual chapter here. So I'm going to open it up. I want to show you what it looks like. Because when I made the book that we used to teach out of, we used to do the a test just on the skeletal system. We didn't split it apart. So everything dealing with the identifying bones in the skeletal system are in my chapter here. However, only half of the material that's in this chapter is on the next test. This is specifically why I wanted to pull this up to show you. So specifically for the next test, we're gonna be going over the appendicular skeleton and this model. This is a model of Bone tissue, compact bone tissue. I have it in here. It's in the Blaylock Quizlets. You need to learn how to identify these various parts on this model. Make sure you review them in the Quizlets as well. There's some terminology. Typically, this, com this terminology is in the Homework 1 module, but some of it is also in, in my book chapter. So just some definition, what is a flat bone? What is a long bone? What's a short bone? So forth and so on, right? What are some examples of these different bones? What are some general features of a long bone? Well, here's a long bone right here. A long bone are the bones in your arms, your appendages, your arms and legs, and your palms, your hands, and your fingers, and all, consider long. Bones that are longer than they are wide, are long bones, right? So we're gonna cover this next week. I'm not going through it all now, I'm just showing you what I want you to do. So make sure you know the science name for the parts of a long bone, the ends of the bone, this part, what's the shaft of the bone called, so forth and so on. Um, it would be nice if you knew how to identify in, in general the major bones in the body, the ones that are labeled. But for the next test, we're not covering the skull. So you're not covering this on the next test. You're not covering any of these pictures on the next test. That's all pictures of the skull. That's gonna be on the third test. All of those on the third test. Then all of a sudden we get, well, none of this on the third test, that's all the thoracic cage, this is where your ribs would attach. We're not doing that next. These are bones that make up your vertebral column. We're not doing that. So you're skipping all of these pictures until you get here. This is the scapula. You're going to learn how to identify the various parts of the scapula, all right? Now, 
I had a mistake in the the appendix, and I don't. I think I fixed it already. But while I'm here and I'm recording this, I want to make sure everybody at least gets this correct. This this is the anterior view of. Hold on one second, please. This is the anterior view of the scapula. And so what you're looking at to your right is all of the lateral side. The head of your upper arm bone would articulate right here. So what I made a mistake, and I think I corrected, but if I did not, number six is called the lateral border of the scapula. Number three, this side is the medial border of the scapula. And I think in the older edition of that file, I had those reversed. So as long as we know that the side over here is lateral and this side is medial, you're fine. So starting with the scapula, that's the anterior view, here's a posterior view. Here's a medial view, the clavicle, the largest bone in your, uh, no, this is the humerus, the upper arm bone. Here's another diagram of where the upper arm bone over here articulates with your lower arm bone. So this will be the brachial bone. These are the anti-brachial bones. Here is a separate anti-brachial bone called the fibula. This is the radius. I'm sorry, this is the ulna. Uh, I'm sorry, ulna. This is an antibrachial bone called the ulna. This is the radius, you're doing that. You're gonna learn the bones of the wrist and the palm and the fingers. Now another one. This is the hip bone. You're gonna be learning how to identify those structures on the hip bone. Here's the largest bone in the body, the femur. You're gonna be learning how to identify all of the different structures on the femur. Here's your lower leg bone, the tibia, and then the fibula. And then lastly, you're gonna identify the bones of the, your ankle, your foot and your ankle. So see, we have a lot to do. Next week's lab is mainly identification. So I don't typically go through lab and say number one is this, number two is that. But you are gonna use your lab time next week primarily to review how to identify the structures. I do have a little talk that I have to go through um, and I will go through some features on these bones, but the majority of next week's lab is like a study hall for you. You cannot wait till next week to start looking at all of these bones. You won't do well. So get through the skin chapter which has less, inf less information in it than this chapter and start on it this week. That'll give you the end of this week and all of next week and into the following week to study because our test is already three weeks from today. That's when our next test is.